We heard earlier in the conference about this idea of dual economies, uh, that, that really there is not one economy, but increasingly two with very different dynamics. Uh, one in which people are living comfortably, uh, where the rich are getting richer, and another in which the poor are getting poorer. And in this, uh, in this panel, we're going to discuss uh, not just some of the dynamics that, that are causing these dual economies, but also thoughts about uh, solutions. And uh, with that, uh, we're going to start uh, with uh, Bill Lazonic, uh, who, uh, you know, has really been one of the biggest critics of the financialization of uh, the modern economy, and whose pioneering work in that area has, I think, begun to finally tip the scales to people recognizing uh, just uh, how serious a problem it is. Okay. Well, thanks, and uh, thanks to INET uh, for funding uh, this research. As we have the uh, slides up there. Um, okay. Uh, I, oops. Can you get the timer reset? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go through uh, the first part of this uh, really quickly because I want to get to the economics and, and uh, of, of what I have to say and what academics can do about it, which is what I'm going to end up on. So first of all, we want stable and equitable growth. It's what I call sustainable prosperity. We want growth so we have higher standards of living. We want stable employment. We want an equitable distribution of income. We want equitable use of the planet's resources. Uh, that's not what we have, and particularly where I live and work in the United States, it's certainly not what we have. We have un unstable employment, uh, inequitable income, income distribution, slowing productivity growth, and uh, particularly the inequity and the uh, uh, un instability has been going on for about three decades. You see it in, in measures of income inequality, uh, a change from a trend tw toward relatively more equality in the post war two decades uh, to from the late 70s uh, uh, extreme inequality. Uh, this is from uh, the New York Times. This is using the Piketty Says data. Uh, the gray line is showing the percentiles of the income distribution and uh, their uh, gains between 1946 and uh, 1980, a 34-year uh, period, and then they looked at uh, the same statistics, types of statistics, income gains uh, from 1980 uh, to, 19, uh, to 2014, and you can see the red line. So this is not actually a dual economy, this is a cruel economy when all the income gains are going to the people at the top, and I'm going to talk about why. We also can see this, and this is a well-known graph that I've used and many other people have used, of that uh, in the uh, post-war two decades, uh, wages, growth in wages tracked growth in productivity, and then there was a widening divergence which continues to go on. Uh, I used this to open up an article that I had a, about three years ago in uh, Harvard Business Review called Profits of Prosperity, Stock Buybacks Manipulate the Market and Leave Most Americans Worse Off. I helped turn Harvard Business Review into a radical economics journal. Uh, the, uh, I, you can break this down in terms of the type of analysis I do, focusing on the business sector, uh, into an era of retain and reinvest when companies retained corporate profits or enough of corporate profits to reinvest in the labor force, keep people employed, and by keeping people employed, having careers with one company, blue collar, white collar, uh, getting more experience, uh, getting higher pay, sharing in the gains of the companies, the company made profits, they shared the gains, that's how you had wages tracking productivity. That's what broke down. Uh, from the, the late 70s, early 1980s, you get into a regime which I call downsize and distribute. Uh, you cut wages, you downsize the labor force offshore, and distribute cor corporate cash to shareholders, and you go crazy doing this in terms of dividends, and, which is the traditional way of doing it, but uh, something new from the early 1980s, uh, stock buybacks. I elaborated this argument in a, in a paper in the Brookings uh, put, put out after the Harvard Business Review article, and you, you can read uh, more about that here. Uh, here's uh, uh, the main graph that shows uh, the looting of the U.S. Industrial Corporation, and that's what it is. This is net equity issues, Federal Reserve full of funds data. It starts uh, in uh, 1984. This is because of a change, which I indicate there, in an SEC rule under the radar that still exists. And it goes crazy, uh, particularly uh, in, starting in the late 1990s, but in 2003, 2007, uh, that net uh, negative uh, 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 net equity issues is mostly stock buybacks. It's almost all stock buybacks. Uh, if you look at this, I, I turn those numbers uh, that were in that graph into a decadal numbers uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, in, uh, re real, real terms, 2015 dollars. Uh, you can see the growth in uh, buybacks decade to decade, and I just 
did it as a percentage of GDP, just to give you some sense of the uh, relative to the size of the economy over time, how that's changed. So you can see it's gotten, it's gotten worse, and it's going to get a lot worse. Uh, this is looking at the same company. If those are net equity issues, these are gross equity issues, uh, maybe um, um, in, in uh, uh, or net negative buybacks, basically. Uh, and that's the blue line, uh, the blue uh, space. Uh, the, the, on top of that is dividends. Uh, in the early 1980s, buybacks were not done or done on a very minor scale. Uh, this is, again, same set of companies, S&P 500 companies, over from 1981 to 2016. Uh, this is just the last decade. If you take uh, the S&P 500, uh, it's $4 trillion almost in buybacks, 54% of net income, and then another uh, $3 trillion almost uh, in, in dividends, 39% uh, of net income. A lot of the other uh, profits are being held offshore uh, be, to avoid taxes. And basically, you get this big boom in 2003, 2007. It goes down somewhat, the red line. Uh, buybacks uh, then goes up to uh, uh, over well over a billion uh, dollars per year uh, on average for these in this case 461 companies uh, and it's uh, last few years it's been uh, over 100% uh, on average of, of net income buybacks and dividends. Uh, you can look at the largest repurchasers and uh, every once in a while including last night we heard of people talking about the firm is a black box is the firm is a black box and you don't understand the economy. Uh, the business enterprise at the center of the economy, and I can tell you stories, which I don't have time to do, we've written a lot of this stuff, about almost all these companies and how buybacks feed into other things that these companies are doing uh, to damage the economy, how they've gone, gone to from retain and reinvest to downsize and distribute. Uh, the concentration of income at the top, the loss of middle class jobs are part and parcel of the same thing. They're not two separate phenomena, and so if you're going to talk about uh, a dual economy, you better talk about the concentration of income at the top, which is generally missing from the skill bias technical change uh, arguments. Uh, in terms of, uh, the, this is from the Piketty and Says data, a lot of, not all, but a lot of the uh, income of the top one-tenth of one percent is so-called salaries of top executives, but the reason it spikes, let's say, in 2000 and, and 2007 is because it's, most of that is stock-based. Uh, we use the ExecuComp database to get the actual uh, pay, because that's not actually what's reported in the media. That's another story of, of the 500 uh, highest paid executives in each year, 2006, 2015. Uh, 2015, uh, over $32 million. 84% of that is stock-based. And it's uh, paid in, done in a way, stock options, stock awards, that it encourages, incentivizes uh, uh, top executives to loot the industrial corporation. Uh, uh, in this, uh, they are aided and embedded and encouraged by many Fed hedge fund activists. I uh, just here compared uh, the uh, uh, top 10 uh, executives 2014 to the top 10 uh, hedge fund managers in terms of pay. They're kind of envious, but they're all involved in this looting process. Okay, uh, the damage it does. It, uh, uh, it's not just plant and equipment, and of course, the modern age, that's not the main thing. Not all companies do research and development. It's fundamentally, you're not keeping employed, you're not retain, training and retaining employees, including on-the-job training, which is the most important way in which uh, you, you raise people's income and create a middle class. Uh, I have an analysis in the paper I just referred to before of the changes in employment relations that have occurred since the uh, 1980s, what I call market uh, rationalization, marketization, and globalization, uh, which all have uh, productive rationalities uh, behind them. Uh, the Americans were challenged by the more productive Japanese. There was a move from uh, 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 closed systems, proprietary system, open system architecture with the new economy. There was uh, lots of people who have lots of capabilities in India and China, and why shouldn't they participate uh, in uh, the, the gains from an innovative economy? Uh, the problem is not that. The problem is that when profits have been made, and lots of profits have been made, uh, it's gone into the pockets of a few people, and uh, it's been done through the looting of the business corporation. These corporations of large, uh, we're not talking about small entities. This is nothing new. It goes back 100 years. If you go back to the 1920s, you have Chandler's, Alfred Chandler's managerial revolution, later Peter, people like Peter, uh, Edith Penrose write about this. Uh, managers at one point led these companies in a retain and invest allocation regime. Uh, but along come economists, 
known as agency theorists, and they say, no, uh, that's, they're, they're running these companies efficiently, inefficiently. Uh, they, it's rooted in the neoclassical theory of the market economy. Uh, and the critical assumption of agency theory, uh, which argues that companies should maximize shareholder value, is that there's a nexus of contracts out there. Everybody's getting a, uh, an income on those contracts, and only shareholders bear risk. And since they have some notion that risk bearing is, uh, has something to do with more efficient economy, absolutely no theory about the relationship between the two, they say, OK, when companies make profits, they should all go to shareholders. They can reallocate them uh, to more efficient uses. Uh, the guru of this, a guy named Michael Jensen, uh, who made these arguments and said that uh, the problem is, not, not, is how to motivate managers to scourge the cash rather than investing it at a below cost on, or wasting it on organizational efficiencies. When he uses the term disgorge, he's somehow saying that that money shouldn't be there. Well, how did it get there? And whose cash flow is it? Free cash flow? You lay off 5,000 people. You avoid taxes. Uh, you can price gouge customers. You, you can create lots of free cash flow. That's what's going on. And that's what's uh, feeding this uh, looting of the industrial corporation. OK, now here's the, the, the problem is this all comes out of neoclassical economics. Uh, it's, uh, 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 first of all, erroneous uh, theory uh, that only shareholders uh, uh, invest without a guaranteed return. I've written lots about how taxpayers and workers uh, uh, always take risk in, in uh, funding companies or in working for companies about whether they're going to get the return. And in fact, shareholders, public shareholders, do practically nothing. Uh, all they do is buy and sell shares. Uh, the prime mode in which they've been extracting value, uh, stock buybacks along with dividends. Now, I want to talk about Milton Friedman. Uh, people might know this article appeared in 1970 uh, in New York Times Magazine, where Freeman said there is one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is, say, engages in free and open competition without deception or fraud. Now, uh, this is the uh, actual uh, lead into that article from the PDF of, of the way it appeared in the New York Times. And it said, a Freeman doctrine of social responsibility of business is to invest in profits. Now, this guy is uh, the chairman of General Motors. Uh, and he's talking to uh, people who were inspired by Ralph Nader called Campaign GM, who wanted GM to address car safety and environmental pollution. And they were demanding that there be three public interest people on the board of directors. So Rob Johnson the other day said, we have to put these things in context. If you know this Friedman article, it's a very famous article, you have to put it in context. It was actually published in response to this demand and to say that uh, companies shouldn't do this, and to give uh, the Friedman Doctrine an airing in the New York Times. Uh, these are the people, uh, some of them well-known, who were uh, wearing these tame GM buttons uh, in campaign GM. Uh, there were 13 members of Congress who were behind putting public interest people on uh, the board of directors, three people, including J Shirley Chisholm. Uh, uh, there were uh, uh, who, who, who uh, this article in the New York Times talks about. Now, here's the thing. Friedman was telling US corporations how not to be innovative in the global economy. What was the future of the automobile industry in 1970? It was safe cars, fuel efficient cars, all kinds of dimensions of quality that he was telling them it's socialism if you invest in these things. And then, as the New York Times repeated, pure and unalterated socialism. This was the future of the innovative automobile industry. This is nonsense. This is a guy who wins a Nobel Prize for telling American companies how not to be innovative. Now, here's the problem. The theory of the firm that everybody, and probably a lot of people here, are teaching is that the most unproductive firm is the foundation of the most efficient economy. If you call that absurd, it's called neoclassical economics, and it's in every economics textbook, including those of Krugman, Siglitz, and many progressive people. OK, now where does this come from? We don't want upward sloping supply curves from firms. We want downward slope. We want economies of scale. And then those companies grow big, then we have to govern them. OK, so you have to have a theory of the innovative firm. So I've been doing this, teaching this for some time. I don't have time to go through it, other than to say there is a something where we talk about strategy, organization, and finance, uh, where we can talk about this, this uh, theory. OK, let me go back here. I just went too fast. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> OK, because I'm trying to <laughs> stay in my time, but I'm going to go a minute or two over. Basically, what you have in the textbooks, if you have a theory of that U-shaped cost curve, is that the most efficient economy 
is when you have no or low productivity workers. So I have some pictures of this, an overcrowded sweatshop, uh, Luddite smashing machinery, some guy falling asleep at, at his computer, or a woman little, making uh, little airplanes while she's doing work. This is the theory that is the theory of the firm in perfect competition. The proof of this is supposed to be a monopoly model, but it doesn't make any sense because it, uh, it uses the cost curves of perfect competition to say that monopolies charge higher prices and uh, 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 have lower output. Uh, it's nonsense, totally illogical, but it's in every economics textbook around the world. Okay, I'm not gonna get into, because I don't have time, the theory of innovative enterprise. You can read about the stuff I've read, written on this, but I wanna get into just two last two slides what we need to do about it. We need a theory which uh, is not teaching millions of people around the world that the most unproductive firm is the foundation of the most uh, efficient economy. How are you going to deal with the economy if that's the world that you're teaching, uh, that you're teaching students? Uh, as a result, neoclassical economists have a trained in capacity to understand firms and oper operating firms. So they call it a black box. It's not a black box. You have to learn how to study them. Okay, it's... Uh, uh, what it does, actually, it makes the market omnipotent and the firm impotent in the economy, so you start talking about market allocation of resources. We have to worry about how firms allocate resources. Uh, and it's actually destroying the U.S. economy and other economies. So last, what can we do about it? Uh, we can de debunk this absurd body, I've called it NOLIS, called neoclassical economics. It really is absurd when you get down to the microeconomic foundations. Build a rigorous and relevant economic perspective based on a theory of innovative enterprise supported by a developmental state. Train academics to integrate theory and history. Academics do not, uh, economists do not learn how to study the economy because they don't know how to combine facts and logic. And then attack the ideology built on neoclassical theory of the market economy that companies should be run to maximize shareholder value. It's not an abstract ideology. It's actually putting people out of work. It's responsible for the concentration of income at the top, uh, the stagnation of everybody else's wages. Thanks. Servas uh, Storm from uh, Delft University of Tech. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I, I, am never, I will never be able to come up that to, this, to this speed, and actually I also want to make a difference. I'm going to be, I am going to remain seated, um, partly to uh, myself slow down and maybe also and ha have you slow down after this enormous, uh, in, uh, interesting and sort of powerful presentation. Uh, my take is going... Disgorge his ideas. Yes, yes, in, in, a, way, in a way it was a flood, yes. <laughs> Uh, anyway, my take is going to be different, not micro, but macroeconomic. Uh, there's a paper on the INET side and on the conference side. It's called The New Normal, Demand, Secular Stagnation, and the Vanishing Middle Class. And in a way, it's going to do some of the things which Bill is also did at the micro, at the firm, at the business enterprise level. I'm going also to try and debunk some of the macroeconomic myths, which uh, happen to sort of in a way sort of uh, blur our minds. Well, anyway, the, the, the setting is the US economy, and I'm basically arguing that the U US economy suffers from two uh, diseases. There's a large literature on the secular, stagl stag uh, secular stagnation of potential uh, output growth. The US is on a slow mo moving turtle. Uh, that's one uh, large literature. The other one is uh, we have the vanishing middle class. We have all these pro uh, problems which, which come with, uh, with the preca uh, precariat and precarious jobs. Peter Temin and Guy Standing have made these arguments very powerfully. Well, my contribution or my take is that these two uh, separate uh, diseases have a common uh, root, and that is basically some, it's technology, uh, demand, aggregate demand shortfall coming out of what I call unbalanced growth. And I try to uh, convince you that, 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 there is a, that, that, I, that I have a point. Yeah, first of all, this is a graph showing that there indeed is a long, if you use the data, there is a long run declining trend in potential growth. I mean, we can always talk about what is potential growth, but if we for now accept the definition, we can see that over time, the potential growth rate of the US economy has gone down. Uh, potential growth in the standard sort of uh, setting depends on demography, that is labor force uh, growth, labor force participation, and it depends on technology, technological change, which is basically defined as total factor productivity growth. 
I will not go into the demography, the labor force participation. It's not unimportant. Actually, many people dropping out of the labor force and so on. So it's not that it's not important. I will focus on technology that is total factor productivity growth, which is actually the main reason why we see this declining. Now, economic theory about total factor pr productivity growth is, uh, in, in a way, there are two takes. One is the solo of residual, that is total factor productivity growth is basically exogenous. It is the residual if we do gr uh, growth accounting. The other take, new growth theory, total factor productivity growth is endogenous, but it is mainly de uh, de determined by uh, supply side factors. Could be anything R&D or education or whatever, but it is. So what it means is if we see total factor productivity growth declining, potential growth declining, it, it means we have a supply side problem and we have to sort of address the supply side of the economy and in a way the demand side is sort of short run, business cycle, whatever, but it's not. This is, this is a structural thing and it is supply side. That is, that is the standard diagnosis and it's actually wrong. Yeah, now, uh, to, do, to make my point, I go into the growth accounting. Uh, in the paper, I sort of do all the growth accounting. Actually, uh, I have some news for you that is the standard idea, textbook idea that there is a solo residual is wrong, there is no residual. If you do the accounting correctly, and actually my discussant Lance Taylor with Codrina Rada uh, have written a paper in which they also uh, do this. Uh, Lance took as a title, putting some beef in growth accounting. I could never have written that paper because I'm a vegetarian, <laughs> so that is, <laughs> but I'm using it. Uh, and the point is that if you look at what TFP growth actually is, is it is uh, basically either weighted average factor payment growth, mostly real wage growth, or it's weighted average factor productivity growth, mostly if you look at the empirical data, labor productivity growth. So when we see potential growth going down, it is actually what we see is a long run decline in labor productivity growth per hour, or same thing, long run decline in real wage growth. Now, two things happening at the same time. Which one is driving which? Well, standard theory would argue, uh, in fact, the labor productivity go growth is going down, and that is why wage growth is going down. This is the marginal uh, productivity theory of income distribution. Anyway, there's a long story to tell, but that is falsified, it's wrong. Uh, uh, the point is, it is the other way around. It's real wage growth, slowdown of real wage growth, which is driving down the growth of labor productivity growth. I, and again, I'll try to make that point. On the real wage growth, there is a very nice quote by uh, nobody else than Alan Green, Greenspan. I, he also introduced the notion of traumatized workers, workers traumatized by job insecurity. Uh, and he noted in the end of the 1990s that there is very atypical wage restraint going on. And my argument here is that is actually driving down labor productivity growth. But the story is slightly more complicated because as Lord Adair Turner mentioned in his talk on, uh, during dinner, uh, average is over. Yeah, we, it doesn't make sense to look at average aggregate labor productivity growth or average aggregate real wage growth. The point is we have a dual economy. This is one of the themes of the conference and I want to go into, into that issue uh, now. We have to look deeper. We have to look at the structure of the economy itself now. This is sort of a part of the growth account accounting exercise which I do in the paper. We look at, I look at sectoral in industry-wise productivity trends and what I find is that there is no secular stagnation in labor productivity growth whatever happening in what you could call the core economy of the, U the core sectors of the US economy which is manufacturing and finance and information. Actually, where there is a big decline, long-run secular stagnation of labor productivity growth is in what we could call the peripheral sector, uh, low-wage services. These are not unimportant so from a social point of view, social, uh, from a social point of view, not unimportant activities, not at all, but they have a very low wage and they inherently have low labor productivity. The jobs, I mean, people say, look out the window, what, what, what kind of, what is the world, where, are we talk, about which people are we talking about? We are talking about people who work in fast food, who work in cleaning, uh, healthcare, education, old age care, personal services. J uh, Paul Samuelson at the, in 1980, uh, 1998 called these mediocre jobs. It's very interesting. Uh, Katz and Kruger uh, um, call this al uh, alternative uh, work arrangements, that is the euphemism. Uh, David Graeber, who's in a way more honest, calls this bullshit jobs. Yeah, it's like we have a whole range of terms. Uh, Samuelson is in the middle, me mediocre jobs. 
Uh, the point is, it's dualization. Yeah, we have a, a fast growing, high wage, higher wage, uh, uh, high productivity uh, core, and we have uh, declining, stagnant, low wage, uh, survivalist, uh, precarious uh, sector. Okay, now, in the paper, I build a model to explain uh, how the dynamics of this core periphery, this dynamic sector and the stagnant sector is interacting. Uh, I won't go through the e equations. I actually try to uh, write up what, in words what the basic logic is. It's like, okay, suppose we have uh, a, a technological improvement in the core, robotization, artificial in it intelligence. Actually, productivity growth goes up in the core. Employment is not going up, so the jobs are actually, the, the sector starts to shed workers. These workers, also there's no welfare state, these workers have to find a job and they all become hamburger flippers, let's say. Okay, now the, uh, this means that uh, productivity in the employer of the stagnant sector, which is the employer of last resource, productivity goes down, wages go down. Yeah, that is, that's the, with wages going down in the biggest part of the economy, aggregate demand goes down, and now it becomes interesting. The fact that aggregate demand, I mean, these, these poorly paid workers cannot afford to buy, I mean, anyway, they, 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 have a diff, more difficult, they have a difficult time paying for the goods coming from the, from the dynamic sector. I mean, maybe they buy, but the point is it's huge. They, if they buy uh, mobile phones, they won't spend on other things. Anyway, the point is that aggregate demand declines, and this is also going to hurt uh, productivity growth in the core sector itself, because it's like what Adam Smith is saying, uh, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, that is specialization cannot happen, and that is productivity growth itself in the, in the core sector will also be hurt by the fact that we have a very unequal sector. This is obviously a Beaumont type unbalanced growth. This is also Arthur Lewis type uh, of, of a dual, a dual economy. The whole point of course is uh, uh, Arthur Lewis was speaking about an industri in, uh, industrializing economy and we are in a way speaking about at least in terms of, of employment shares of a deindustrializing economy. Okay, that, this is the conclusion. There's, some, there's actually one more slide. This is, so in a way, it's not just the conclusion, but I think this is basically the summary of the point I, 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 I want to make. That is, uh, yes, we have a dual economy. We, have, we don't, I mean, it doesn't make sense to speak about secular stagnation at the aggregate level because in a way, the, pro, the, the technology dynamism is very much there. The point is, it's not uh, sort of, it's actually creating a problem in uh, the non, uh, so-called so non-dynamic uh, sector. There's job insecurity, there are the mediocre jobs. What's very important is this fact that uh, the slowdown of aggregate demand because of high wage inequality, the fact that we have a, a precariat, is uh, slowing down the division of labor and the rate of labor saving technological progress in the dynamic sector itself. Uh, very importantly, again, I have no time to go into it, but uh, monetary and fiscal policy in the US actually reinforce this dualism, this process of unbalanced growth, and in a way what they do is they put, have th th these policies put, or in, in any case, keep the US economy on the slow moving tur uh, turtle. Now, we have to also be a little bit forward looking and positive, so there was a big request, what can we say to sort of reverse the uh, the, the, uh, the unbalanced growth and the, the two problems. Well, I've given a list. Uh, first one is, well, we need some policies to uh, keep up wages in the stagnant sector. I mean, these are very socially productive uh, tasks. Think of healthcare, old age, education, schooling, whatever. I mean, all these, 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 uh, these jobs are extremely important. They have huge social value. The whole point is they are not being uh, paid uh, uh, properly. At the same time, I mean, I, I said Calder talks about an incomes policy. The incomes policy has to do with speaking about what is a minimum wage floor, but also what is a maximum wage floor, but how much, I mean, all these rents in the financial sector, these high, very high incomes in the financial sector, for instance, to what extent do we think as a society is this, to what extent is this, accept, is this acceptable? I just want to point to work by a colleague of mine, Gerald Epstein, who did a sort of incremental cost-benefit analysis of the social efficiency of the financial sector in the US, and he finds that for every dollar of extra profits in the financial, US financial sector, there is a dollar loss uh, for the real economy, uh, if, and that is when we do not count the, the cost of the financial crisis. Yeah, I mean, that would actually mean a dollar profit for the financial sector, five dollars loss for the, uh, for the real economy, but if we forget about the financial sector, then it sort of 
totally parasitical. Yeah, it's one dollar of profit for the financial sector means one dollar of loss for. So it's like, why are we allowing this? This is called as incomes policy. We have to devise institutions to do something about this. Second thing is, I think that nothing will work if we don't uh, create countervailing uh, power for workers, which is exactly what has been demolished after 1980. Uh, the way to do it, I don't know. There is an old idea by sweet, two Swedish economists, Rehn and Meitner, who were talking about a wage earners fund, which is basically socializing. So this is not at the e end of pipe universal basic income. This is not uh, taxing robots, which is st still maybe a sort of end of pipe. This is actually go for the radical interpretation of the second theorem of neoclassical welfare economics. That is, we, we reallocate property rights before we exchange. Yeah, this is uh, what it means. It doesn't, it, it's not the same thing as giving shares to individual workers, it's giving shares to workers as a group. Yeah? And workers as a group have to sort of, they become not individual shareholders, they become a group uh, shareholder of firms. Anyway, I'm not sure whether, uh, but I, this might be totally infeasible. Uh, true, uh, anyway, but so, so many things are infeasible. Anyway, the, 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 the that's what we're all about here. Yeah. Anyway, then, the, then there's the, the Keynesian idea about the socialization of investment. Keynes was not very uh, outspoken or clear about what he meant. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, liberty to interpret what he uh, actually meant. So I'm going to sort of put in my own interpretation here. Uh, that is, uh, I think it basically means we have, to, uh, we, we, we have to get rid of the liquidity, the excess liquidity which is actually running around in, uh, in the uh, global financial system, the shadow market uh, system, which is sort of being used by whatever spec speculators in OTC derivatives, which is actually being insured by collateraliz collateralization, uh, securitization, and so on. In a way, this is all, tot as Gerald Epstein is saying, totally unproductive. So, that is one step, try to sort of put some uh, the, the limit to what fi finance is actually doing, make finance socially use useful, and it will mean industrial policy, I will not say much about it, it's new forms of industrial policy. We have to guide uh, the financial sector because they cannot uh, do it on their own. No, the final sheet is two more things, and that is actually also wrong because uh, during the confer conference, I uh, actually have five more things. One is, uh, I, my argument is not Luddite. I'm not saying we should stop the robots because they are taking American or European jobs. Uh, actually, I think uh, I, I fully understand the uh, civilizational benefits of ICT. I mean, each morning we enjoy the product of the latest ICT technologies in the form of Donald Trump tweets. I mean, sort of a high point of... Of, of civilization, so that is not the point. I'm, all not, I'm also not saying higher wages alone will do the job, no, we, it's socialization of investment, wage under funds, and so it's much more com industrial policy, much, much more complicated. Uh, okay, I'll stop with the two points here. I think if we don't, the, the, the cost disease, that is higher wages for socially extremely useful uh, activities, I mean, in the 1970s, we were much poorer and we could pay for many of these things. We are much richer today. And then there is the story that we can't afford. Uh, I mean, I, 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 anyway, there's a, I can't see why. So the, there is a, I call it visionary pra pragmatist. Uh, the reforms which I'm pr uh, 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 proposing, the Dutch prime minister I'll, uh, one said that if you have a vision, you need to go to an eye doctor. That is the, what he says. But I think uh, if you don't have a vision in these times, you are actually totally irresponsible. Uh, we have to think about what Christine Lagarde said, about the groundswell of popular discontent, which we are actually experiencing, main topic in this conference. Uh, anyway, the dual economy, unbalanced growth is the major motor force of this groundswell. And if we don't attack it or address it, it will not stop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, next up, we have Mariana Mazzucato, uh, who uh, I know as the author of The Entrepreneurial State, which is, for me, uh, one of the books that I wish all of my peers in Silicon Valley uh, would read, study, internalize, and act on. Thank you. Tell them to do that then. Yeah. <laughs> Fire for them. <laughs> Right, so this is great because I'm gonna pick up at the end on the details about the socialization of investment point of Keynes, which has definitely been under theorized. But, um, and similar to uh, Bill, but sort of the uh, mirror image of that, I'll argue that unless we have a theory of the state, not just as a counter cyclical 
uh, sort of investor of last resort, but a theory of the state throughout the whole business cycle, as he was saying, we need a theory of the firm, then we actually get less innovation, much more financialization, and more inequality. Um, and I'll talk about that in terms of actually also rethinking where value and wealth actually come from and admitting that it's very collective and the role of the state has not just been sort of in the background fixing things and leveling things, but actually taking this investor first resort uh, role and what happens when we don't admit that. Um, and so first, talking about vision, as you were, that we need visionaries, you know, to be, to be honest, there is actually quite a lot of vision out there. If you go to either the European Commission or the OECD, they talk about that we actually need a particular kind of growth, directed growth, they don't use that word, but when you talk about you know, sustainable, inclusive, innovation-led smart growth, that's actually talking about, you know, it's not enough to have growth for growth's sake. We have these sustainable development goals, which you might, as some do, including myself, sometimes think that kind of look like a, a shopping list of all sorts of things. Actually, they're very concrete. There's 146 targets underneath them, and the great thing is that more than 100 countries have actually signed up to them. So whether you like them or not, the fact that they've actually been signed up to presents us with a real opportunity to rethink how we are directing economies and investments in both the public, private, and increasingly the third sector. And of course, after the financial crisis, this need to rebalance economies, this term that's often thrown out there, also pre you know, presents us with an opportunity to provide vision. Um, what I want to argue is that's impossible. All that stuff is absolutely impossible without having really kind of bold, ambitious, interesting public policies that are really able to think outside of the box. And, you know, we are part of the problem. Even those cool people that talk about innovation and innovation systems and talk about the role of public policies as simply de-risking or enabling or facilitating, whereas I hear all the time, even in my uh, Schumpeterian community, we have a problem, right? So words matter. Uh, Tony Jutt was very good on this. He said that the uh, kind of, you know, fall of the state in some ways, the whole kind of Reagan, sorry, Reagan, Thatcher era was accompanied by a change of words. He says that, you know, all of a sudden this word administration pops up in the 1970s. The state administers, you know, how boring is that? And so, you know, is the state really just setting the rules of the game, creating framework conditions, which the European Commission talks about all the time, solving and fixing different time types of screw-ups like market failures and system failures, or is it doing something different? And if it is doing something different, and this isn't always, but in the times, in the last 200 years in which capitalism actually produced uh, growth, innovation, and big in, um, increases in productivity, if we don't get that, then we have a huge problem, not just for innovation, but I want to argue for inequality. Um, and so, as I said, the wrong theory of the state does lead to less innovation, more financialization, more hoarding, and more inequality. Obviously, this is not the only source of these problems, but it absolutely is part of the solution to rethink what we even mean by public administration, public governance, and bureaucracy. You know, why does the word bureaucracy often sound like a bad word? Um, there's all sorts of interesting writings out there that we could go to, which I don't think have been uh, listened to enough by economists, including Keynes. Keynes was not just about countercyclicality, as I've already mentioned. He really talked about the role of the state as needing to have big ideas, really doing what's not being done out there. And what's not being done out there is not just a market failure. It's a lack of uh, you know, investment and opportunities, a lack of really pushing technological frontiers and also getting new types of relationships. And that's, I think, the relationship issue is part of what he actually meant by the socialization of investment. Carl Polanyi, of course, was one of the leaders in this, really arguing that actually, you know, markets were forced into existence from day one. The capitalist market was forced into existence, so even the word intervention makes no sense. Whether you like interventions or not, whatever side of the political spectrum one might be in, the word intervention is wrong because markets are actually outcomes. They're outcomes of public, private, third sector, even civil society actions. We wouldn't have the weekend or the eight-hour workday without trade unions, and that absolutely shaped and co-created the market. So we should be very careful with our use of the word market, and actually I learned a lot about this from Bill, who always says don't confuse business with the market. The markets are outcomes of business, public, and, and other interactions. Um, so when I first started writing about this, sorry, little self-promotion here, but I love the German title, Das Kapital, the Stat, it was very much about not just admitting the role that the state played in the history of technological revolutions, but really rethinking what does this mean in terms of portfolios, investment, and theory of the state as active market shaper, market creator, not just market fixer. 
The new book I'm writing that's out in the spring kind of takes that one step further and says if we don't get that, then actually a lot of value extraction and you know, Bill's uh, work and other people's work on this panel have talked about different forms of value extraction actually happen in the name of value creation. This is what's new, by the way. Value extraction is not new, but how it happens in the name of innovation and dynamism and competition um, and creativity is what's new. And unless we beat, debunk the underlying theory of value underneath those arguments, we're going to have a problem. You don't just tax wealth as Piketty's book uh, taught us, that obviously should be done, we also have to have a new theory of where that wealth actually came from. Um, anyway, so I wanna sort of unpick this into four questions, which I'll go through very quickly. I have just over eight minutes to go through them, so not more than two minutes per point. But this, you know, what I'm trying to do in these four questions is really to say, let's even change the questions we're asking. It's not just that the answers are wrong, the questions are wrong. So this first one about, you know, should policymakers pick you know, make decisions that actually direct the economy or just level, it's just completely the wrong question. You know, what actually led the creation of all these, you know, general purpose technologies, which we know have been key drivers of growth, forget whether that growth was sort of right or wrong, depending on what some of, you know, how these technologies then were used, um, the way that these uh, technologies actually came about was actually through directed change. You know, the internet would not have happened if the state was just leveling and fixing things. Um, and, uh, don't worry, I won't go through my usual iPhone example, but you know, the iPhone example in, in uh, my book was not to say that Steve Jobs and, and, uh, and, and John Ives, who I've actually become friends with, uh, uh, were not geniuses. It's, you know, how can you have an 800-page book on Steve Jobs without you know, one page, one paragraph, one sentence, one little word on how all the tech in these smart products, internet, GPS, Siri, touchscreen, was actually funded by ambitious, strategic, directed public policies, which doesn't mean that you go out there and you pick one technology, one firm, and you know, really narrow down your investments in the state, but unless we actually understood how those ambitious programs came about, often through not even worrying about this stuff, not worrying about commercialization, but really going for the mission, Right, so go to the moon, don't worry about how that's gonna end up in the iPhone, but then surprise, surprise, you do get all these spillovers. Um, and one of the big risks today is increasingly some of these organizations, which you probably can't see up here, but the, you know, the DARPAs of this world, are increasingly being pressured actually to think of commercialization first. Uh, this is absolutely happening, happening in NASA. I have a couple of papers out with Doug Robertson uh, talking about how NASA itself, its mission has almost become commercialization, and that's gonna be a problem for commercialization itself. Um, this isn't just uh, you know, defense, it's not just Cold War, it's health, it's energy, it would be very hard to uh, talk about you know, great innovations in pharmaceuticals and nanotechnology and biotechnology in the clean tech sector without seeing the role of these public mission-oriented organizations. Uh, this includes, of course, public finance, you know, this exit-driven VC industry, which uh, Bill and others have critiqued as having actually created quite a few problems in industries like uh, biotech. You know, even the Death Valley phase of the innovation chain can last 10 to 15 years. And when the VC guys just want to exit in three to five years through a buyout or an IPO, what does that actually do to the innovation process? Uh, in some new work I'm doing with Gregor Semenyuk, who I think is here at the conference, we've been looking at this also in clean tech, and you basically see the same thing the very high capital intensive, high risk, high uncertainty phase of this industry, which is still emerging, has absolutely been led by different types of public actors. Interestingly, in this sector, unlike in IT, you also have the role of public banks. Um, public banks, which used to mainly be focused on infrastructure and catching up and counter cyclicality, but increasingly, precisely because of the short termism in the financial sector, have been having to supply even the kind of VC kind of money, so the high risk, early stage, high risk investments. And these are basically four banks the Chinese, German, European, and the Brazilian bank before things went completely. Uh, crazy in Brazil a year ago. Um, and this is you know, the example of the KFW one, which again, is not just providing counter-cyclical lending, but is directing that finance. And we have a very hard time with this. You know, these kinds of actors, which aren't just public banks, I often argue even the BBC gets accused of this, of crowding out the private sector when 
you had these actors actually having not just you know, this leveling role, but actually having an ambitious role of directing finance, in this case, not just to the SME population, this generic word that we think is always a good thing, but actually you know, picking, in some ways, the willing, not the winners, the willing firms, small, medium, or large, that are actually willing and able to co-invest alongside, alongside different public actors um, around these visionary, ambitious programs. The Chinese Development Bank, again, fascinating. This might look like a lot of money that they're pouring into particular companies, but you know, um, Elon Musk got five billion, nine zeros, from the US government for um, Solar City, Tesla, and SpaceX. And obviously, lots of these funds don't always do well, right? Entrepreneurs are often bragging about how they're willing to take risks. And of course, that's very important. You have to be able to take risks. But as soon as you know, things go wrong, in a public entity, like a public bank, or the Cylindra example, we get very worried, and again, tell governments to step back, don't pick, don't pick Cylindra, but guess what? The government also picked Tesla. Tesla got a similar amount of money as Cylindra, but no one knows that, and also it wasn't actually constructed then as a portfolio, I'll say this on my last slide, which is, well, what would have happened had the government actually admitted it wasn't just a lender of last resort, but an investor of first resort, in that whole kind of clean tech space. By the way, fracking as well was initially government financed in terms of literally how it constructs the portfolio so it doesn't just pick up the downside, but also perhaps in different ways get some of the upside to fund the inevitable downside and the next round. So really quickly, this also um, uh, requires talking about the actual organizations. This is not just public money. This isn't just money thrown out there. This occurs through particular organizations, most recently through ARPA-E. And it's very curious that Trump actually hasn't yet cut the budget for energy, but he's going after the organizations. And money, by the way, comes and goes, right? You can increase uh, uh, money one year, you can Im implement austerity the next year, if at the same time you've killed off the public organizations that are crucial to this directed investment, that could take up to 50 years to come back. Um, and I don't think we fought that battle enough. Um, I won't go through this, but again, all the organizations I mentioned before actually ha have had missions, including these public banks. This doesn't mean it's necessarily good. I would argue Trump also has a mission, but we have to understand how some missions are sent, who decides, what does this actually mean again for that whole portfolio. Um, and also, you know, we need a theory about this. We need a theory about organizational, public organizational capacity building, experimentation, exploration. In the same way that we have dynamic capability of the firm from Edith Penrose's work, we should have a dynamic capabilities of the state because it matters. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, obviously we're going to get the uh, uh, a problem of, of creating lots of failures if in the same time we've outsourced all the capabilities. And I would argue that part of what Bill was talking about was rationalization, marketization, privatization, et cetera, has also led to an outsourcing of state capacity, which also makes it, by the way, much easier to capture, right? So Jamie Galbraith's book, The Predatory State, <laughs> yes, uh, we know the state does get captured a lot, especially when it doesn't have a theory of its own role. Um, equally important is assessing this stuff. There's no point in doing it, and by the way, it's often not done, country where I'm from, Italy, is not today making these kinds of investments. It's just subsidizing. It's not co-investing. Subsidies often create predatory and parasitic relationships. But if you do do it, if you do do the BBC learning program of the 1980s or you know, the kind of green vision that China, Germany, Denmark have today, how do you measure this stuff? Well, surely, if we have a critique of market failure theory, which I think lots of us have contributed to, we then also need a different way to assess a market shaping, market creating role. And uh, I don't have time to read this, but Keynes was very good when he you know, said, actually, out there, uh, we don't really have all these wolves and tigers and lions that you would think of when you think of the word animal spirits, but there's lots of domesticated animals, you know, gerbils and hamsters and pussycats. And so how do you actually dynamize and get business excited to even want to roar in that animal spirits way? Well, you know, providing these mission-oriented strategic direct investments, which then are followed by the private sector, how do we measure that? And isn't it interesting that even the good stuff, which is crowding in, not crowding out, still sounds negative. We actually don't have positive kind of, you know, action-oriented words even when we want to describe that crowding in process. Um, so, you know, how do we actually capture that? Pushing the market frontiers, which is absolutely what DARPA did. It is what the BBC has done in its own space. How do we get a different type of crowding in, crowding out analysis? 
um, as opposed to you know, immediately worrying when there's any of this ambition, well, that's part of the research agenda. Um, my time's up, but these guys went over at least two minutes, so I will too. Uh, <laughs> not more than that, I promise. Um, and, and this actually does require a new theory, or even a theory, of public value. Isn't it interesting that philosophers talk about public value, but we don't. We have this word public good, and of course, it's very useful, um, and, and, but we put it in the, in the context of correcting a screw-up, right? Correcting when you have positive externalities and that creates underinvestment, so we need to fix that public good problem versus really giving that word an ambitious, again, action-oriented, visionary understanding of what public goods are. So this is what we're trying to do in this new institute I've set up at UCL, rethink public purpose and public value. Um, Lastly, and I won't take more than a minute to do this, we need to think of you know, this whole inclusive growth agenda, which has become quite rightly so trendy. Lots of people talk about it. What does this actually mean, and how do we relate that back to the understanding of where wealth comes from? Because if we continue to have this kind of uh, idea that business creates value and the state either just redistributes that value or at best facilitates, enables, and de-risks it, this agenda is extremely hard to do. Herb Simon you know, talked about this when he said that if we're generous with ourselves, uh, a large part of the income that we pretend is coming from marginal uh, 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 incomes is actually coming from this socially distributed creation of wealth. This is a quote I've never actually seen uh, discussed by people who talk about Simon. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, two important investors, have admitted this. But what does this literally mean for the concept also that some have talked about in terms of pre-distribution? Um, and what's very interesting uh, about Piketty's analysis is that period in which, you know, after the 1970s in which um, inequality rose so much, there was lots of really regressive taxation policies, like capital gains tax falling by 50% in just four years, which were, as I said in the beginning, done in the name of value creation, in the name of wealth creation. So this great quote by Buffett saying, well, why did you do that? Why did you reduce my capital gains? I don't even you know, I don't even look at that, he's actually talking about what Keynes said, that actually what we need are public policies that create those opportunities versus in the name of opportunities, reduce things like capital gains, which actually only increased inequality, as he says here, only decreased the number of jobs, didn't actually affect investment. Um, and Keynes's concept of socialism, socialization of investment, I think also goes to the heart of this. This isn't just saying we need more public money spent on green or health. This is also changing the characteristics of that investment, and I'd like to argue that this is about changing the deal or the contracts. You know, patents are contracts, they're not rights. Um, so what does it mean when we talk about the state as one of the lead creators of value, not just redistributor, for literally all these different types of contracts? Bill was talking about share buybacks. Well, you know, Bell Labs, you know, which was a, a reinvestment by AT&T of its profits actually came out of government at the time being quite confident and saying in return for this, you know, monopoly that we've given you, you have to reinvest your profits in the real economy, in innovation and big innovation. Are we asking that today of our monopolies? Or again, you know, patents, we are patenting the wrong things. We are increasingly patenting upstream. The tools for research are being patented. That's new, and that's a failure of negotiation between public and private, precisely for this publicly granted 20-year monopoly. Lots of regressive taxation policies are innovation policies. The patent box, that's crazy. Wrong kind of contract. Again, patents are already 20-year monopolies. Why are we reducing the taxation paid on the profits generated from a 20-year monopoly, we should really be thinking of the incentives that lead to more innovation, and that's, that doesn't happen through that. I would also argue we should sometimes, not always, retain equity. Had the government actually retained three million shares in Tesla, which is what Obama said he was gonna do, had Tesla not paid back its loan, completely reverse thinking, had they, you know, because then Tesla did pay back the loan in 2013, took it out in 2009, 465 million guaranteed by the taxpayer. Had they done the reverse, then the price per share went from nine to 90 in that period. Multiply that by three million shares that would have more than paid back the Solyndra loss and the next round of investment. The reason we don't even ask these questions is because we haven't admitted this collective value creation process. And until we do that, we will have more inequality, more financialization, and less innovation. I'm done. <laughs> All right, we are, we are uh, adding up the uh, 
The, the, no, we're adding up the message here. It's pretty powerful. Uh, now, Mario uh, Sekaracia, uh, you are going to have to deliver the, the knockout punch. Oh, God. <laughs> and then Servas <laughs> is going to bring it. <laughs> I mean, uh, thank uh, you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm not sure if I got knocked out first or from the from all this. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I am uh, going to speak on uh, an issue which, uh, in some ways, is I mean, is directly connected with all these issues pertaining to dualism and growth and so on. Uh, but it's usually uh, presented as a kind of all-purpose you know, policy tool there uh, to ultimately uh, bring back the economies to some sort of golden age almost kind of uh, world that we had in the early post-war period uh, and, and eliminate the kind of dualistic structure that has been plaguing uh, you know, most in industrial countries now for the last uh, you know, 40 years, let's say. Uh, now, let me uh, just say that there has been you know, a, a lot of discussion in, in the last while uh, over this issue of dual e economies. And uh, uh, what uh, is clear is that this kind of distinctive sort of structure of dual systems is in fact what we saw as a phenomenon uh, right at the beginnings of the industrial, you know, the first industrial revolution here. I mean, if you're thinking of this, city here, and you had an observer like Adam Smith looking at what was going on during the uh, first Industrial Revolution. Well, what we had, in fact, was a, a kind of growth process that looks a lot like you know, the usual, what we're imagining dual economies, as Arthur Lewis later on tried to you know, uh, uh, theorize about, and uh, where you had basically an enclave uh, you know, uh, sector growing, a manufacturing sector in that case, and the rest of the economy pretty much on a sort of stagnant, subsistent income, so to speak. And uh, now this, of course, kind of decoupling of growth in productivity and real wages was in fact very typical of that industrial era. And uh, in fact, it was used almost as a model that we should be you know, essentially uh, pattern it on, you know, in terms of Rostovian type, you know, type takeoff here uh, towards industrialization and all that. You know, it was once seen in that light. And this kind of phenomenon, though, of decoupling of real wages and productivity growth uh, and the polarization of incomes and all that really has re reappeared in, in, uh, in more recent times. And uh, in fact, there was, however, one period, an exceptional period, let's call it, during the, in the, well, right after the Second World War, that is sometimes referred to as the glorious 30 years in French, I prefer that term than the golden age, uh, because it actually provides a historically specific period when this happened, okay? And it allows us to be able to understand what were the institutional features and policy framework that took hold during that period that led to this kind of recoupling, let's call it, uh, uh, of productivity growth and real wages. So that if you look at the, I mean, th these are graphs you've seen, had Peter Temin, uh, you know, showing it as well. Uh, I, I took one for Canada and the United States alone. And what we see here, there's that whole period, let's say from the, this is from 1950 only, uh, but you could see all the way to the mid 1970s, uh, you did have this kind of pattern of growth where you had uh, real wages and productivity moving somewhat in tandem. But then you got this huge bifurcation that we've never come out of, basically, okay? and, and that is connected with this dual structure. Now, the, the purpose of what I want to do in this uh, paper here that you could read up online, I guess, so once it will be put online, is that, uh, is that what we've seen here is that uh, the, this pattern that used to be pretty much uh, familiar to all the classical economists okay, in the early period, okay, of the, going back to the late 18th and early 19th century, has returned, I mean, what, for what reason? And secondly, does this all-purpose you know, idea, now there are different forms, as we're gonna see in a minute, of guaranteed income proposals, okay? Will they be able to address these kind of disparities and, and get it back on track, so to speak, as we saw during that kind of 30, glorious period, you know, years of, 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 of growth. Now, uh, if you look at it back, just to go back very quickly to the, uh, the, the 19th century views here, uh, all these classical writers basically had a belief that there was a kind of general tendency for wages 
to be, you know, that was called the iron law of wages. They had all kinds of terms for that. But basically the idea being that, that there was some sort of natural normal level of wages that pretty much kept them around a subsistence level. And it wasn't obviously a physiological kind of a view that we find in Malthus and all these early classical writers. Most of them, including Adam Smith, basically had uh, something akin to a kind of a bargaining power theory of how this would happen. And in essence, all of them, whether it be uh, Smith all the way to Marx, at least, during the 19th century, what we see is this view, basically, that real wages are determined, the sort of subsistence wage here that, that tends to be around which where wages will gravitate, uh, will be determined by both legal kind of societal norms as to what it should be, uh, that are often dictated by the state or by certain conditions or frameworks that are allow this to happen but also, of course, their bargaining power themselves that is often you know, related to the growth process as such, you know, the high growth or not in an industrial economy. And uh, in fact, the traditional sector formed the backdrop really for what you would have in terms of transfer mechanisms as well when real wages in the industrial, the enclave sector, uh, perhaps went below even subsistence, then that, that kind of traditional sector would be the one that would provide the transfers to maintain this labor force so that it was an equalizer, so to speak, as well. Now, uh, this kind of classical vision of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, you know, of the dual economy, of course, is what you also find in Lewis, and he tries to interpret it in a way that indeed, I would argue, uh, is similar to the way these classical writers, not completely, there, was, there are neoclassical features of his model, but nonetheless, uh, what we find is a vision that uh, where you have a subsistence sector, you know, the traditional sector, as he calls it, and the capitalist sector. And also, of course, the real wages that he imagines in the subsistence sector, again, that are determined by normative kind of factors. They're not in the neoclassical sense of demand and supply mechanisms, okay? Now, the, uh, I will jump into, uh, basically, I'll, I'll go for uh, 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 Now, this kind of Lewis model that, remember, this was, uh, he, he originally wrote that paper in, uh, in 1954. Uh, it was basically uh, uh, used as a way to say, look, that's the way the, the economy uh, was was in fact evolving, and developing countries should try to pattern that because what was in the early post-war period happening was in fact this kind of elimination of dualism taking place as a result of the high growth, you know, the golden age period that we were talking about earlier where we had this coupling of productivity growth and real wages. And therefore, there was this idea basically that we should embrace this kind of classical model of growth in order to be able to ultimately achieve what was then deemed as the, you know, the way in which these economies were evolving. And clearly, this is not what happened. On the contrary, okay? uh, what happened was the complete opposite, as we saw since the 1970s, mid-1970s and 80s. And, but during that early post-war period, though, what we did have is some important developments, some of them having to do with full employment type policies in place that basically depleted labor reserves in these in traditional sectors in the industrialized countries at the time. And also, you had a whole support system in place that actually percolated in the, already in the, er, in the early interwar period and during the Second World War that led to important changes right here in Britain, for instance, a good example was the beverage plan okay, that led to these major legislative reforms uh, at the time. So these two elements here that came into play in the, in the period of the post-war period, of course, were, uh, were, uh, were allowing this to happen. Okay? Now, there was a retreat. I don't have time to get into the retreat because I do want to get to the guaranteed income here, but the retreat, we know what happened, globalization, financialization, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what, the point that I wish to address at this point, can a guaranteed income, which has been something that many, in fact, where I'm coming from right now in Ontario, in the province of Ontario, we have a whole experiment, experiment going on, a three-year experiment in trying to set up something that is akin 
to the negative income tax type uh, income that I'm going to mention in a minute. Uh, but uh, I have a diagram here where you have total income on the vertical axis and employment income on the horizontal one, just to give you a kind of stylized view of these different types of proposals. And I have two types there. There's the UBI, which is the universal basic income, and the other one, which is the old, the old Friedman type guaranteed in annual income, ne negative income tax kind of proposal going back to 1962. And what I did there is I just took something that is close to what is actually being proposed in Ontario, what we have there. In fact, it's not 15,000, it's 14,000 US dollars, around 17,000 uh, uh, Canadian dollars in this case, as the minimum guaranteed income, that little GO there, that GO amount, okay, that flat line there. And you got, at the other hand, you got as income rises. Now, the way it works is literally what we had in the Friedman one, which is that there's a tax back rate of 0.5. So they deduct against that income, uh, I, I'm sorry, they deduct the uh, one half of that income against your guaranteed income. And, and so you could see that bridge. If you could look at that kinked line there, and you could also see the transfer, which is that uh, extra amount vis-a-vis uh, -vis the basic income one is at the bottom there, 15,000. So in the example I have there, if somebody also takes up a $15,000 job, then he, if it's for the individual income earner in this case, by the way, not for the uh, family one, but for the individual one, they would give you 22, uh, five or whatever, okay? So what we have here is one type. There are other, the UBI instead, the universal basic income is just simply see it as an add-on there where I have it summing both here, simply. Okay. So in that case, there's no negative income tax effect here. And, uh, oh, there's, I didn't indicate the actual income tax that would ensue later, obviously. But in terms of the transfer side, there it will be the full amount added, period. Okay. So you can see that line on top there that gives you the full amount for UBI. Otherwise, they're very similar, needless to say. Okay. Now, the difference between these two types of uh, programs, of course, has to do with uh, the fact that the, uh, one is, is going to give you considerably higher, usually it's proposed by the left, the UBI, and it's going to be considerably higher than that, which is, of course, the gay NIT proposal, so to speak, here. Okay? And, uh, but all of them are what uh, uh, Polanyi used to call aid in wages, or a simple add-on to employment income. And that's important. Now, uh, one of the uh, uh, byproducts, I call this here, of these programs, of course, would be whether or not it could form a basis of the sort of subsistence income flows here that we saw in the 19th century version of a dual economy. Okay? And if it could provide a basis that could move it upwards and eliminate it, ultimately. And, and here, of course, uh, if you look at what neoclassical economists have been saying, of course, they worried more about the disincentive effects of these uh, schemes okay, in terms of you know, uh, work uh, disincentives, et cetera, et cetera. But most neoclassical, oh, excuse me, most uh, non-neoclassical economists, more, more heterodox economy, tend to, of course, uh, take the Polanyi sort of view here, which is that they look more on the demand side as in terms of incentive effects that arise if you create these kind of conditions under this framework of, of policy. And what I try to show here, basically, is that uh, if you look at the way in which these, uh, uh, these uh, programs are put in place, okay, the question then is, and I'm just going to jump to the really important aspect here, which is that there are certain incentive effects on the employment side, if you wish, that are critical, that was, were first highlighted. Actually, it wasn't just Polanyi. Polanyi was one of those who talks about the Spearman effect. Okay? But in fact, this goes way back to some of the early historians of the, uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution, like uh, Paul Mantou, I referred to one example, okay? who referred to these problems that arise as a result of these demand side incentives that are created as a result of the existence of a guaranteed income. Because what it does is that it generates what we call uh, these uh, compensating effects. And remember, Milton Friedman, Frederick von Hayek, George Stigler, all these people supported this type of income, uh, you know, this income support here. And obviously, they weren't trying to get more people on welfare through guaranteed income. What they wanted to do was to get them off welfare in order to be able to you know, take up jobs out there, 
And why? Because, of course, as, as in fact, uh, I quote Friedman from 1962, uh, it's, uh, he argues that this would not distort the market, the labor market, or impede its function with the existence of a guaranteed income, because what it does is it creates more flexibility on, on, for market wages to take hold as a result of that. And what I've argued here over the years is that there's a kind of compensation effect of these guaranteed incomes that would uh, basically reduce workers' resistance to cut in market wages because you have this compensating effect in place. Okay? And, and I, what I try to show here, and I, I, I know time is up already, but I just want to highlight two things and then I'll leave it at that, which is that this compensation effect is affected to some extent by the tax, by, uh, tax back rate, uh, uh, how much it would be. Uh, I, you, you, know, you could see that there are different types of tax back rates that uh, could uh, appear. Uh, but more importantly, it also is critically dependent on the size of that minimum income. Obviously, if you pay everybody $100,000 uh, know, to workers, it, you're not going to get these kind of incentive effects. But if you pay them $5,000, then you're going to end up because they cannot possibly live on $5,000. Okay? So you have this effect taking hold depending on what would happen there. Now, as you know, the original forms that were proposed by Milton Friedman and others basically wanted to eliminate all other forms, of, like minimum wages, et cetera, et cetera, in order to eliminate these floors to the system. And this is the whole logic of this, is how can this happen in the context of a guaranteed income? And the point that I've made is that unless you have both these floors that exist because of other institutional arrangements in the system, and also if you have full employment kind of policies in place that would reduce these kind of incentives from actually taking hold, then you would get back to this kind of recoupling, if you wish, that would be you know, more like the old golden age kind of scenario that you, would, uh, that you had in the early post-war period. Without that, you're going to end up, to the, uh, uh, you're just going to make it worse in the market sector by creating even further dualism. Okay, I'll stop there. Yeah. All right, so, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we got started quite late, but we're running late, so now we're going to ask Lance Taylor to respond and uh, give us uh, some perspective on these issues. Well, thank you very much. I'll try to keep within my time, although I may not. Uh, <laughs> Tim was asking, was, was I going to talk about my own research or was I going to comment on the other people? And I think I'll do a little bit of both. Uh, the first point, one point I want to raise is that uh, we, US and other rich countries don't just have a dual economy but they have a trial economy. There, there are funny words in the literature like trialism or triality. And uh, I just want to sort of emphasize a couple of aspects of this uh, three-way structure in the US. Uh, what we did in our own research, there's the well-known Congressional Budget Office uh, income distribution study. And essentially what we did was merge that uh, with the national accounts and the Federal Reserve accounts on, on, the, on the financial system. And what comes out quite clearly from the data is that the US really has a sort of three-class economy, uh, divided among the classes in several ways. The main income of the top one, CBO only goes to the top 1% as opposed to the top 10th or the top 100th, but uh, the main income sources of the top 1% are capital gains, proprietor's income, interest in dividends, and wages, which are called wages, as Bill has emphasized, a lot of that is actually bonuses and, and uh, other payments to capital. So the top 1% is essentially, are essentially capitalists. Uh, then in the data between the 60th and 99th percentile, you have a middle class who get 70% of their income from wages and sort of 10% each from transfers, finance, and proprietor's incomes. And then the bottom 60%, you could draw the line someplace else, someplace else 50 or 40, uh, but the bottom 60% get half their income from wages, almost half from transfers, and a little bit from these other sources. And I just have some data to illustrate what's been going on between these three classes. There's a guy, Gabriel Palma, at the University of Cambridge, who has proposed taking the ratio of income at the top to, ratio to people at the bottom. And notice the upper line is the Palma ratio uh, for uh, the top 1% versus the uh, bottom 
And now that really shoots up. That's sort of almost 10% growth over, four, over 30 years. The Palma ratio is a bit more fair to the middle class, but nevertheless, there's been enormous redistribution, which the other panelists have, have pointed to in various ways. Uh, you have then, here's the real income of the top 1%. Capital gains to the top, transfer income doesn't count, interest and dividends, proprietor's income, and labor compensation. Notice that the labor compensation has gone up pretty sharply, but it still is a relatively minor part of the real, inc real income of the top 1%. The other sources are capital. You can see the same thing here. Here are indexes of labor, labor compensation, uh, 2005 at 100. The top 1% shoots up, uh, and there's much less growth of the other two classes. Uh, the other thing that's important in terms of, for example, the Piketty study is that there have been enormous capital gains at the top. Here is the, where part of the capital gains are coming from is the Q ratio. Notice very rapid growth between the 1970s and the stock market crack, boom and crash. And now, it, now it's come back up again, so capital gains become an, become an important transfer vehicle. As it turns out, capital gains, capital losses of business, of the business sector in the Fed data, uh, exceed retained earnings. So in fact, profits have been more than transferred away from business uh, to, the, to the other groups, in particular the top group. Now here's a sort of typical slide uh, for a PowerPoint presentation, which you cannot possibly understand. <laughs> but uh, the stuff highlighted in yellow, I'd just like to point out, this, this is essentially what we did was take Fed data and then apply uh, the existing studies to try to break that down across the income classes. And there's sort of two or three points I'd like to make. First, the Fed data don't add up. Uh, the yellow highlighted boxes uh, at the bottom there should have zeros. Uh, with uh, holdings of assets or holdings of claims being offset by uh, issuance of claims. That's not true with the data. And then look at the breakdown at the bottom. Uh, you see essentially that real estate is mainly, the bulk of real estate is held by the middle class. Uh, the bulk of equity is held by, uh, the, uh, is held by the upper class. And uh, in terms of the distribution of wealth, roughly 40% goes to the top 1%. Uh, 60, let's say 59% goes to the middle class, and 1% goes to the bottom. I might add that, that in, in the national, if you try to look at the, consumption, at the uses of income data, the bottom 60% have negative savings. And that's true in, OECD, in, mo, in the OECD, OECD countries for which data exists. Negative saving essentially means they can't build up wealth. Now I'd like to talk briefly about how these data relate to the existing papers. Service's model, I think, is, is very interesting in the sense that he assumes it's a dual, dual economy model, and he assumes essentially that if people get crowded out of the, of the rapidly growing sector, if they go into the stagnant sector, uh, then uh, what happens to the overall distribution and what happens to productivity? Uh, as it turns out, there was a debate in the 1960s, inspired by Arthur Lewis, uh, in part, uh, between Theodore Schultz and, and Amorto Sen. Uh, what happens in the stagnant sector, the subsistence sector, if labor departs, if it goes into the advanced sector? Sen said that, in fact, output would not go down because of job sharing. That is, if people get crowded into stagnation, into the stagnant sector, their wage, wage payments go down. If they go out, their wages go up. So that there's an inverse relationship between employment and productivity. Uh, now that, I think, is a fairly realistic view. Now it's obviously offset by other things like by transfer payments, universal basic income. But if you take that view of how the world works, then there are a couple of conclusions that follow. One, what is going on in the modern sector? Uh, there is a well-known, well-known uh, model by, by Nicholas Kaldor, which says that productivity growth is being stimulated by output growth. What happens if the productivity growth schedule shifts upward? Will that generate enough profits uh, to pull people in, to promote investment and pull people into the, into the advanced sector? Uh, or will people be crowded out by higher productivity? That depends in part, then this goes into complications of macro, that depends in part on part of the modern sector is wage-led or profit-led. Uh, if profits go up, does that stimulate output demand in the modern sector, or, or, does, or do wages stimulate demand? Uh, 
In fact, you can show that if the modern sector is wage-led, and here Service and I have a little fight that's been going on for a few years about whether or not it is wage-led or profit-led. If it's wage-led, in fact, people will be crowded out. They will go into the subsistence sector. That will force down productivity in the subsistence sector, and you will like, you'll then end up in a stagnant situation. And then the question is, how do, you, uh, how do you try to offset that? You come back to the things the other people have been mentioning, that you can think about expansionary policy, policies to promote productivity growth, uh, and policy coordination. Economists usually understand policy as, as sort of let's play with taxes and, and let's, uh, let's uh, uh, push this lever, that lever within the economic system. But policy is more a, a question of institutional steps how do you offset monopoly power, prices rising against wages? How do you offset monopsony power, wages fall against prices? And uh, those are the kinds of institutional innovations that the other panelists have been talking about. And one could ask how they would fit into a macroeconomic picture, which I think would be an interesting thing to do. With regard to Mario, uh, I, he draws very heavily on Carl and Kari Polanyi, I think, in, in, in what he has to say. And uh, I think what I tried to do was say something about uh, what would be the macro implications of the kind of, kind of proposals that he's been making. Uh, if you look at US data for 2014 uh, and look at transfer programs that exist, uh, the big ones are Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and more recently, the, the Affordable Care Act. But there are around 60 government transfer programs in the US uh, which don't relate to each other very, very effectively. Uh, but if you try to estimate total transfers to the three classes, the bottom 60% were getting around 1.9 trillion in, in, in 2014. The middle class was getting 550 billion. The top 1% were getting 20 billion, which is a small drop in a big bucket. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it's, you can ask how a transfer package would, how a sort of UBI system uh, would, stack up against, would stack up against those programs. The U.S. working age population around 200 million. If you give everybody of working age $10,000 each, $10,000 each, the total would be $2 trillion. That's as, as big as existing programs. Uh, and uh, sort of 10,000 is not that much in, in the U.S. context. Uh, there, of course, and there are complicated issues of tax buybacks and, and that kind of thing. Estimates of tax, tax back for people at the bottom of the income distribution in the U.S. are over 50 percent. Some are up to 100 percent. And uh, that is, uh, so that there are a whole series of fiscal engineering issues that, are, that would arise. Uh, and, but nevertheless, $10,000 each is not going to be very much in the American context. Just to give a, you know, I worked at the top of the Social Security payment level for all my life. I'm getting about 40000 per year. Uh, and uh, that doesn't add up to a lot in terms of trying to maintain, <laughs> maintain a living standard. Actually, I'm on a waiting list for a Tesla. And... <laughs> <laughs> and I may not live long enough to get it, <laughs> but that's going to be a lot more than 10,000. Anyway, most people don't buy Teslas. Uh, with regard to Bill, uh, I guess I would have maybe two or three comments. Uh, his emphasis on the surge in stock-based pay is absolutely correct, of course. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the total labor compensation of the top 1% is comparable to capital gains and less than proprietors' incomes, less than, uh, less than interest and dividends. So their quote-unquote wages, which are not really wages, as he emphasizes, are not the dominant income source. Uh, that is, the key point is the top 1% basically re re relies on income from capital, broadly interpreted. And uh, it may not be the top 1%, could be the top 2%. In the econophysics lecture literature, there's a, a shift. People in econophysics like distributions with fat tails. And there's a shift in the distribution from exponential to, to Pareto at around the 98th percentile. So maybe the capitalist class is 2% as opposed to 1%, but nevertheless, they're the ones at the top. Now, another important point that Bill makes is that maximizing shareholder value uh, has been very influential in how corporations have been operating. 
But I think the point he doesn't make, which is a little bit surprising, I would say, is, is that shareholder value really is an ideology. It, it's interesting how the word value gets applied in various ideological contexts. Of course, just think back to Marx. Uh, and the question I would ask is whether innovative enterprise can replace uh, creating value as a dominant ideology. And uh, the same thing you could ask to, to Mariana. And uh, it's not clear to me that that will happen. Uh, that is basically the comment I would have about what Mariana has been saying, that, that it's all microeconomically extremely sensitive. Uh, but whether it becomes uh, a, a phrase that can pass along to the masses and, and they will uprise and, and, uh, and will push innovative enterprise, I think, is very much an open question. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Oh, let, let me add one more point about my own stuff, uh, which one does, except the slide is not advancing. Uh, the main point is that if you sort of try to project uh, what's happened uh, forward using a simple macro model, uh, what you see are the effects of various kinds of policies on Palmer ratios. And sort of policies that apply only to the, to the labor market essentially make the Palmer ratios go down uh, roughly half the amount that they rose over the last 40 years. If you then have some kind of wealth fund, uh, you can, uh, the Ren Meidner Fund or something like that, uh, which builds up wealth, transfers resources to the bottom 60%. You can also have some impact on the distribution of wealth and get it down uh, from growing to 60% in the middle side of the bottom. 60% share back down to something like 40% over 40 years. So if you want to reduce 40 years of increasing inequality, uh, it's not going to be very easy, and it was likely to take quite a bit of time. Now I'm done. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I think this has been a fascinating discussion. I think we probably have a dual economy now of people who would like to ask questions and people who would like to go to lunch, uh, because we actually used up all the time uh, for the session. So uh, if, if you would like to leave, uh, I think nobody will be offended. But if you want to ask questions, we can take a couple. So uh, OK, we have, we have mics going down. Uh, well, there's a mic over there. So just kind of run one here. So come on up. Actually, from all your um, different interventions, I understand that the role of the state has to be increased in order to regulate the um, repartition of wealth. But the issue is that um, you have this vicious circle, which is like an increased financial sector, funding politics, who are actually keeping the, the policies in place. I'm thinking about Trump and Macron election, which looks uh, pretty different, but actually are the same in terms of um, preserving the, the wealth of the top 1%. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to know if you could give us some hope on this change. And, uh, yeah, what was your opinion? Uh, you know, I, I can take that one. I, I think <laughs> that until uh, there is a real understanding that uh, right now we've got populist politics who are wolves in sheep's clothing, uh, I think we're not going to change that. I think we do need to actually uh, create a, a new constituency around uh, pr a progressive politics that is uh, not uh, nationalistic, that is not uh, uh, plutocratic, but that it is actually about the issues that we've been discussing at INET. Anyway, o o over to you guys. Uh, yeah, just, um, and this is in part responding to Lance's statement, it's not how much the executives are getting paid, it's what in, they're incentivized to do, mm -hmm. okay? And it's, you might pay them $1,000 more and they might do $3 billion in buybacks to get the $1,000 more. And, and certainly, I certainly everywhere argue, shareholder value, uh, maximized shareholder is, a, is an ideology, okay? So, and obviously, uh, anything is an ideology uh, that when you put it in, in general terms, the question is, what is the implication for reality? Uh, and the reality is uh, that uh, if uh, given the power of business organizations, we can't do without them, 
but we have to govern them. Uh, somehow we have to get uh, the business leaders to be responsible to the organizations and uh, to uh, creating value in those organizations and sharing the value uh, if we're going to move forward. Because I think what the question was just raised, if you don't, they're going to pad their own pockets and they're going to get politicians to do what they want and the politicians will go along with that. So, but if you don't even understand what that is, I mean, and this is coming back to the economists, you know, if, if they don't have the slightest idea and they teach that uh, the unproductive firm is the foundation of the most efficient economy, it's in every textbook and it's been there for 70 years with just reflexively talking about this, you're not going to even be able to move one step forward as uh, we're talking to economists here, <laughs> as economists to how, to how to address this question. Yeah, I, I want to respond to the question from the audience, if I, yeah. uh, if I may. I think it's an extremely important point. Uh, the, the answer obviously is not simple, but I think both in the US and in France and actually in the Netherlands and in Germany, what we have seen is total collapse of social democracy. And I think that is the main item. It's like the social democratic movement or the left or whatever has to reinvent itself. It basically meets, m needs new thinking and it needs, as Mariana was saying, new words, a new uh, yeah, new concepts, like we have to uh, rethink, the, and, and the, the, the fact that these things, these populists, whatever, change, big changes, and ultimately just reinforcing the status quo are happening, is uh, by default, yes, by, by, the, by the fact that the, 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 the alternative is actually out of fuel, 